On the evening of that day, this is Resurrection Sunday, this is Easter Sunday. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when, he, when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Ask for his help today. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be yours. We're so grateful to read this gospel account that you have written through the hands of John and preserved for us today that we might join in in reading about the resurrection of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the great rich history that we have of fellow brothers and sisters who testified to the truth of the resurrection and celebrated it every day of their lives. Lord, I'm even reminded of that as we sang that hymn. Maybe the oldest hymn that we sing, a hymn that dates back to like the year 700. What a reminder that what we, what we do as we gather here today is not anything new, but it is something rich, something that your people have been doing for centuries upon centuries. It is to gather and hear your word, remember the crucified and risen Savior in Jesus, and celebrate together. Lord, what an honor it is to gather as your people today. We pray that as we come to your word this morning, that you would be our teacher. That Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes that we might see you. Open our ears that we might hear you. That you would exalt Jesus before us, that we might leave here worshiping him. We need your help today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, not too long ago, a little over a month ago, on July 29th, there was uh, a very large lottery drawing that happened for a lottery prize of $1.34 billion. That drawing happened on July 29th. A winner was chosen. And the last I checked up until this point, that winner has not come forth to claim their prize. A ticket, winning ticket was drawn in the state of Illinois and it has gone unclaimed. Now, I've read that it's not uncommon when there's a lottery prize this large that it takes a little while to process and figure out, like, what am I going to do with $1.34 billion? But there's also a decent chance that someone bought a lottery ticket and put it in a drawer and forgot and is just walking around, going about their business, having no idea that they just won $1.34 billion with a B. Someone could be walking around the state of Illinois just doing their mundane life, not having any idea of the good news that they've won $1.34 billion and the clock is ticking because they only have a year to claim it. That's insane to me. 
to think about the idea that someone could be walking around just not knowing the news, the good news. And yet we see that happening right here in John chapter 20. The disciples on the greatest day in all of human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are living in absolute fear, in hiding, precisely because they have not heard the news. Jesus is alive. He has resurrected. That is a fact. And yet the disciples are living their lives as if he is dead simply because they haven't heard the news. There are so many people today walking around, living their lives, exhausted, striving in fear, precisely because they have not heard the news of who Jesus is and what he's done. In fact, there are also many today, maybe some of us even here this morning, that claim to be followers of Jesus, but are living our lives exhausted, striving, afraid, in hiding, worried, because we've forgotten the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. Jesus comes to his disciples to announce this news to them in person, in the flesh. His, his desire is, to, is that they might believe everything that he has said about himself, that they might believe he is the promised Messiah. He is the one who has saved them from their sins. He is the Lamb of God who was slain for the forgiveness of their sins. He is the God that has resurrected from the dead and will ascend back to the Father. His aim is to show them, I am not dead, I am alive. And so he goes to deliver this news himself. And everything hinges on the disciples believing the news that he brings them. As we pick up in John 20, we see that the Jews are locked away in hiding. The doors are locked. It tells us very precisely, John knows he was there. They were doing so because they were afraid of the Jews, the, the ruling authorities that came and put Jesus to death. At least that's how they're thinking it in their minds. If they would come after the one we followed, how much more might they come after us? But we know from the words of Jesus, it wasn't the Jewish authorities that killed him. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And I may take it up again, which he has. But the, Jew, the, the disciples are afraid of the Jews. So they go into a room and they lock the doors and they hide. And they're in fear. And I don't know what they're doing. They don't have football to watch on a Sunday. They don't have their phones to entertain them. They're just sitting there. I don't know what they're doing. They're just in hiding worried, fearful, not knowing what to do next. And then we're told in John's account, it says the doors were locked and Jesus came and stood among them. He seems to be saying Jesus didn't come with like secret knock on the door. It's just one moment he wasn't there and the next moment he was there. In the same way Jesus passed through his, his burial clothes, it seems as though he's now passed through locked doors and just appears before his disciples who are afraid. And he says to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, when Jesus says, peace be with you, it's not simply a greeting. As if you haven't seen someone in a long time and you say, hey, I don't know. I don't, we don't greet each other this way, but my, peace be among you. Like, no, we know, but that's, that's not what Jesus is doing. He's not just giving them some, you know, polite greeting as if like, hey guys, it's been a couple days. Peace be with you. No, he's making an announcement to them. He is actually pronouncing a blessing upon them. He is actually giving them something. He's communicating something to them. In fact, Jesus had said this earlier in John chapter 14. He had said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus had told them earlier, I'm giving you my peace. Don't be afraid. And now he comes to them. They are very much afraid. And he says to them, peace be with you. He's pronouncing a blessing of peace on them. And now when he says peace, he's meaning something far more deep than we tend to think when we say peace. When we say peace be with you, we usually just mean like, hey, hope you feel good and aren't worried about things and just good tidings to you of some sorts. But when Jesus says peace, he is actually announcing something. It's the great compliment to what he said on the cross as he died. It is finished. 
And because it is finished, he now can say, peace be with you. Primarily to mean, I have accomplished peace with God on your behalf. And now in my resurrected body, I pronounce it to you. It is yours. You are now accepted by God. You have restored relationship with him. Peace be with you. Not just glad tidings and good feelings, but actual restored relationship with God the Father because it is finished. So he shows up and he doesn't waste any time. Simply tells them, I finished the work and guess what? Now here's the blessing. Peace is yours. You don't need to be afraid. You have peace with God. And he shows them his hands and his side as proof of purchase. Right? Some, of you, some of you really keep those receipts on hand. I'd never keep a single receipt in my life. Everything's online, right? No? Some of you keep receipts because you know there, there might be a day I need to show. I did purchase this. I need to return it. I need to exchange it. Jesus comes to them and announces this blessing and shows them the proof of purchase. He's like, look at my hands, my side. I accomplished peace. It's yours. Romans 5 tells us this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, by believing in what Jesus has done, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is only available to those who believe. Peace with God is not something that every human being has a claim on, has access to. It is only through belief in Jesus. Romans very clearly says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ not through our own efforts, not through our own strivings, not through trying to be good. We have peace with God only through Jesus Christ. And so he comes to announce it to them. And it will change their lives. Ultimately, it will change their lives forever because there is a great power to having peace with God. That does not just simply change your eternity, it changes your now. Because if we have peace with God, it means this. If God is now for us, who can be against us? Church, if we would believe that, that because we have peace with God, it means that God is now for us and not against us for those who believe. That will fill us with confidence as we walk about our daily lives, knowing no matter who comes against us, no matter who doesn't like me, no matter who says a false word about me or slanders me, or doesn't approve of me, no matter who may come against me, I can know for a fact, because of Jesus, God is for me. I can endure rejection. If I have peace with God, it means I don't need to be afraid of bad news. Because no amount of bad news can take from me the greatest of all blessings that I now have peace with God. Psalm 112 tells us that for those who fear the Lord, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Is that true of you? I'm going to be honest, I spend a lot of time worrying about bad news coming my way. But the scriptures tell us, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Because he does not fear receiving bad news. Friends, if we believe that through Jesus we have peace with God, there is no amount of bad news that could come our way that will remove that or take that away. We have peace with God. Having peace with God means we also have joy despite our circumstances, which is what we would see mark the lives of these very disciples until the day that they died. Eventually, dying for the name of Jesus, they would be willing to lay down their lives to endure the worst of circumstances because in the midst of that, they had a joy knowing that they had peace with God. Filled them with confidence, not only before others, but before the Lord too. So Jesus appears to them in the midst of their fear and he says, guys, this is what I accomplished on the cross and now I bring it to you. Here it is. Enjoy peace with God. In case they missed it, he repeats it again for them. One of the most like generic sentences in the Bible, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. 
They go from being locked away, terrified. Jesus died. The guy that they spent the last three years giving everything for, following, thinking this is it, this is the Messiah. He's now dead in the grave. They're terrified. And then he shows up and it says they were glad. Sometimes things don't come through in the English language quite as well as how they're originally written. This is communicating that they were overjoyed. They've been transformed by seeing Jesus. They are filled now with joy. Their sorrow has turned to joy, which Jesus promised in in John chapter 16. He says, you mourn right now, but I'm coming to you and your sorrow will turn to joy. And it's happening right here. And so he repeats to them again, peace be with you. And he says in verse 21, as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Jesus' work of accomplishing salvation is finished. But it doesn't mean God's done working. He's now chosen these men, these disciples, to say, in the same way that the Father in heaven has sent me to accomplish the work of salvation. I am now sending you to carry the message of that to the nations. That's an honor. We get to be brought into the mission plan of God to carry it forward, to not just be a cul-de-sac of the gospel where it just comes in and then just kind of stays here nice and safe and protected, but to be much more like a highway that carries it from place to place says, even as I've been sent, so I'm sending you. And I'm sending you with power and authority. Now, there's many scholars that say that this this act of sending the disciples is very similar to to a Jewish concept in this day and age. A Jewish concept of something called, I'm butchering this because I don't speak Hebrew. So if anyone does in here, well, no, none of you do. So here we go. Uh, (laughs) It's the Jewish uh, title of being a, Shaliach. There we go. Okay. A Shaliach was someone that would, that that a master would choose to carry out their affairs as they're approaching death. They would have the authority to make any decision for them. They would have the power to make those authority, that authority, those, that authoritative decision. And it was considered that when you are dealing with that person, when you are dealing with the Shaliach, you, it as is as if you are dealing with that person who sent them because they now hold all of the power and all of the authority. But it was very important that as this person was assigned, they were given the rightful power and authority. And there are many, many scholars that say that is exactly the idea, the concept that Jesus is unpacking as he sends these disciples out. Essentially saying, I am leaving, but I am giving you all of my power and all of my authority. So much so that as people deal with you, as they hear from you, it will be as if they are dealing and hearing from me. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he doesn't just send them out with good wishes, good instructions, a a, a good book to follow. He also sends us with his very own power and authority. And the same could be said also of us today. He sends us as his representatives, his ambassadors, with his power and his authority. First, it tells us something very strange. It says, when he said this, he breathed on them, which is, that word breathe is, is when we translate it here, breathe, or when the creators of the, or the translators of the ESV translate breathe, it's kind of trying to communicate in a way that makes sense to us because the word is a really weird word that doesn't make sense to us. The actual word says he, he, blew, he blew on them like hard, like just like, which <laughs> is not really how we tend to think of Jesus. So it's much, it sounds much better to say he breathed on them like, a, oh, it's much more regal. It's much more kingly and appropriate, right? But it, it, something strange is happening here. Jesus, <laughs> have the Holy Spirit. Here you go. And I don't know if he spit as much, but you know. <laughs> He's blowing air on them. He's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of debate and talk about what is happening here, especially in light of what we see in Acts chapter 2, where it's like, isn't isn't that when the Holy Spirit comes and makes his dwelling with God's people? Yes. 
I don't think John is, is trying to give his own interpretation of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But I think what's happening here is Jesus is kind of giving us, in many ways, kind of an acted parable pointing forward to the fulfillment of what's to come. I think in a very, a very real way, he is giving them the Holy Spirit. But we are also told in the scriptures that there is a way in which the Holy Spirit will then fill them in Acts chapter 2 that he still quite hasn't fully done yet here. But he's saying to them, as I send you out, I'm going to give you my anointing, my power, my very own presence, my spirit. And it's going to come in fullness very, very soon. And he also gives them his authority. Look at what he says. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. He's essentially saying to them, seems like you have the authority to declare whether someone is forgiven or not and whether they have rejected Jesus and are not forgiven. Now, again, there's lots of different interpretations that have come from this. In fact, here in, in this very verse, you'll have, a very, um, you'll have a very distinct dividing between the Roman Catholic Church and what we would believe. Or the Roman Catholic Church has taken this to say, what this means is that there are specific people, the apostles, and those in power that have the authority to declare thou art forgiven. And I hold that authority to declare that over you. But the tr tradition of Christianity that's carried this forward has said that's not so much a pronouncement of giving forgiveness, but more this idea that as the church, God has given us the gospel. He has given us the authoritative way through which someone's sins are forgiven. It is through believing in Jesus. And as the church We've been given the ability to say that right there is a genuine confession of faith. Therefore, your sins are forgiven by Jesus. And that right there, that is not a genuine confession of faith in Jesus. So I can know based off what the Bible says, your sins aren't forgiven. Not because I have the authority to do it myself, but because I can declare based off of what God has told us that that's not true faith in Jesus. Therefore, your sins are not forgiven. This is part of what we do as we've, as we, we've talked about this. As we finish John, we're going to start approaching uh, church membership and establishing that as a church. This is much of what we do as a church. When we welcome someone into membership and we baptize them, we as a church are coming around them saying, the confession of faith that they give before us, the life that they live, demonstrates that they are genuinely a follower of Jesus. Therefore, we baptize them. We as a community come along and say, we affirm this person's genuine confession of faith to say their sins are forgiven. Not because we have the authority to dole it out, but because Jesus has entrusted us with the gospel and very clearly showed us the ways in which our sins are forgiven. So when we hear a genuine confession of faith and a life that demonstrates the fruit of that, we can affirm this person's sins are forgiven because this is what God said. Does that make sense? So Jesus is sending them out to do that. This is somewhat the natural outcome of preaching the gospel. As we preach the gospel and invite people that, to say, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and yet Jesus has gone our, on our behalf in our place to pay the price for our sins. And if you repent and believe in him, you will be saved. Essentially, there's two responses to that. Faith, i.e. forgiveness of sins, or rejection, not the forgiveness of sins. It is somewhat even just the natural outworking of preaching the gospel. But he's giving it to his people. to say, here's my power and my authority. I'm sending you. This is an incredible moment between Jesus and his disciples. But there's one problem. Thomas didn't show up. Thomas, one of the 12 disciples, didn't show up. I'm sure he was invited. I'm sure he knew they were getting together, but Thomas was the guy that says no to the hangout only to find out later it was the most epic night ever. It's like, guys, wait, what, what happened? What do you, what? Why wasn't I there? You're saying what happened? He probably has FOMO the rest of his life, I'm assuming. <laughs> Thomas is like, I, I gotta be at everything because I have the, the greatest fear of missing out. Last time I wasn't there, this happened. Thomas isn't there. He's in bad company too, because now he's the only one of the 12 disciples, him and Judas, to not have seen the resurrected Lord. And he hears the disciples talking about it. And as you can imagine, they go to Thomas like, bro, Thomas, 
How did you not come, man? We saw the Lord. Oh, crazy. What are you talking about? The other gospels tell us that he thinks that they saw a ghost. But they come to Thomas and say, we've seen the Lord. Now Thomas, Thomas loved Jesus. Thomas probably desperately missed Jesus. And it must be painful for him to hear. They seem to be saying he's alive. It seems as though he's almost a little offended at their news. In the same way, I, I, I can imagine that for some of us that have lost a loved one, and it's maybe been years, if someone came to us and told them, that loved one, I saw them, they're alive. You would probably be a little offended. You would probably be angry with that person a little bit to think, how dare you come to me and tell me that you think you saw the one that I love? Now, we don't know for sure that that's what Thomas is feeling. The text doesn't necessarily tell that. But it kind of, I can imagine, he was, he's feeling something along these lines because he refuses to believe what they say. Now, Thomas has gotten this reputation because of this story to be doubting Thomas, right? In fact, when many of us think of Thomas, that's what we think. We think, oh, doubting Thomas. He didn't, he, he, he didn't believe. He doubted that Jesus rose from the dead. And it leads us to need to talk about this a little bit, about what is, what is doubt? Because I think there's a question here. Is Thomas doubting or is he just simply refusing to believe? Because I think there's a difference between those two. What is doubt? Well, well when, when some people talk about doubt, they say this about that doubt. They say, well, don't ever doubt anything about Christianity. Never doubt, just believe. If you ever have those doubts, just stuff them to the side. Turn it off. Just believe. Don't ever doubt. There are some people that will say that. Maybe some of you have received that. Others will say, doubt everything. Don't ever receive anything anyone says. Doubt it all. Go explore it all. Don't ever trust what anyone says. Doubt everything. So what do we do? <laughs> what do we do with doubt? Well, here's the thing. If, if by doubt we mean this, be skeptical and don't believe because you can't really ever know anything. If that's what we mean by doubt, then surely the Bible warns us against the doubt. In fact, Satan might be the first, well, is the first one to introduce that kind of doubt into the world in Genesis chapter three. When he comes to Adam and Eve and he says, did God really say that you can't eat? Comes to human beings and, and gets them to question God's authority, God's love, God's goodness. Did God really say? Or James 1.6, which warns us that the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So if by doubt we simply just mean be skeptical of everything, you can't trust what anybody says. If that's what we mean by doubt, then surely the Bible speaks very clearly against that, that that will destroy us. But if by doubt we mean more something along the lines of being honest about our questions and seeking truth rather than just receiving what I'm told and actually investigating the truth, well, if that's what we mean by doubt, then the Bible actually invites us into that. In fact, Jeremiah 29 tells us, God gives an invitation to humanity. Seek me. Seek me. And, and, and when you... When you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It's this invitation from God to say, come and explore, come and investigate who I am. Come and seek to find me and discover me. And when you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. That kind of doubt is not evil. That kind of doubt, if that's what we mean by doubt, it spurs questions and consideration and critical thinking and leads us to seek answers. In fact, I, I can bet that there are many of us that have had those kinds of doubts that we've pursued answers to and it has grown our faith. I think Thomas is in a different place than that. I don't think that's what Thomas is experiencing. In fact, I think you can say, I don't think Thomas is doubting. I think it's actually a lot worse for Thomas. I think Thomas is straight up refusing to believe. 
He is saying, I will not believe what you're saying. You are insane. And so look at, look at what's happening. The disciples see the resurrected Jesus and they come to Thomas to be eyewitnesses and to, here's what they're doing. They are sharing the gospel with Thomas, right? Thomas, Jesus died and he rose again. Everything he said is true. He is who he says he is. Our sins are forgiven. He's the Messiah. Here's the gospel, Thomas. And what does Thomas say? You're absurd. That's, that news is false. It's not true. What is he doing? Thomas is rejecting the gospel message from the mouths of eyewitnesses. This is not simply doubt of like, well, I don't know, guys. I mean, that seems just a little far-fetched. No, he is saying, look at what he says. Unless I see, unless I put my fingers, my hands in the nails and in his side, I will never believe. Friends, that's, that's not doubt. That's him saying, I refuse to believe this nonsense. Unless something absurd goes down, I won't. Thomas is only willing to believe on his terms. God, if you show up in this way, I'll believe. If you do this, God, then I'll follow you. This is rebellion from Thomas. And he's not just rejecting the disciples' message, he's rejecting Christ. He's saying Christ is not risen, Christ is dead. I refuse to believe. He's making God bend to his demands and pass his tests if he's going to believe. Sure, he says, you know, there's a chance I'll believe, but only if God jumps through my hoops, passes my tests. And yet, what's amazing, eight days later, Jesus comes to meet him in that very place the mercy and the grace of God. In the midst of Thomas's rebellion and his refusal to believe, eight days later, Jesus, oh so tenderly and lovingly, recreates the very exact scene Thomas missed out on. They're right back in that room. The doors are locked. So they seem to still be scared. Maybe it's Thomas' influence. Maybe Thomas like locked the door when no one was looking. Like, guys, you say he's risen, but I know they're still looking for us, so lock the door. Jesus also tenderly comes to meet Thomas and recreate the same scene. The doors are locked. Jesus shows up. Says the same thing. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, verse 27, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus knows what's going on in Thomas's heart. He knows it's not, he, he knows Thomas is not in this place of just like, oh, he's just so close. He knows Thomas is refusing. So Jesus says, do not refuse to believe, but believe. And he comes and meets him in that very place, in the midst of all of his rebellion and refusal. Jesus comes right there and says, here you go, Thomas. And we don't get an indication from the scriptures that Thomas touches Jesus. It doesn't tell us. For to take it at face value, it seems as though Thomas does not need to touch him at that point, but simply falls on his face and says, my Lord and my God. One of the, one of the most rich confessions of the identity of Jesus right here. From a man who moments ago was stuck in his rebellion and his refusal to believe. He says, my Lord and my God. Let me ask you this this morning. Where are you with your doubts and your questions? We have so many different kinds of doubts when it comes to the Lord. Many of us maybe have intellectual doubts, having a hard time understanding how some of this Bible gospel stuff comes together. How does it make sense? 
Some of us maybe have experiential doubts of, I, I don't know that how I can quite make sense of what I've walked through and what I've experienced from what God tells me life is like and who he is. I don't know how to make sense of these experiences. They make me want to question what I seem to be, know about who God is. Or maybe some of us have theological doubts of God. You have said that this is who you are, and yet I just don't seem to be able to grasp that. I don't know if I can believe that that's true. Every single one of us has doubts and questions and unbelief about who God is. All of us, me, you, all, every single one of us do. If you don't, you're honestly, you're probably just lying. I don't know that there's ever a point in our life. No, there is not ever a point in our life where we get to a place of, I believe everything about who God is perfectly all the time. No, we will always be dealing with an element of unbelief in our hearts. In fact, the reason we sin is because we're not believing something about who God is and what he's done or who I am. So if you're putting all this pressure on yourself to live a life of following Jesus without ever questioning or, or doubting or struggling or not believing, you're going to get exhausted. The question is, though, what are we doing with those doubts, with those questions, with that unbelief? Maybe we just sit with it. I think I'm not supposed to feel it. I'm not supposed to think this. I'm not supposed to explore this. But look at what Jesus does with Thomas. Jesus is not afraid of Thomas and his doubts and his questions and his refusal to believe. He's not afraid of yours either. I don't care how smart you think you are. If you think you have the most intellectual doubt ever, God is the smartest being in all of existence. He created everything out of nothing. He's the most rational being there is. He's thought through everything. There is, there is nothing you can bring to him where he's gonna be like, oh shoot, I didn't think about that one. He's not afraid of what you have. He's the most compassionate being in all of existence who welcomes you as you are with what you have. He's kind. He's personal. He knows you. He knows your story. He knows your experiences. He knows your history. He knows what you feel. And he welcomes us as we are to come to him with all we have. If that weren't the case, he wouldn't meet Thomas. In fact, he not only doesn't wait for Thomas to come, but he comes to Thomas and says, Thomas, here you go. I'm meeting you right where you are. Don't disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas does believe, and Jesus gives him somewhat of a gentle rebuke. He says, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those that have not seen me and yet have believed. You know what's so cool about that? If you believe in Jesus today, he's speaking about you. That's amazing. He's, Jesus is saying that there is a kind of believing that's better than the one Thomas experienced. There is a kind of believing that's better than having the resurrected Jesus appear before your very eyes, holding out his pierced hands and his side and saying, don't disbelieve, but believe. Jesus is saying there is a better kind of belief than this one. And it's the ones that don't see me and yet believe. John's been unpacking this throughout his gospel. He's been telling us that the kind of belief that relies on miracles is a faith of lesser value, of lesser, um, it, it doesn't have as strong of a foundation. Jesus said this in John chapter, or John said this in John chapter 2. That Jesus has been calling people to believe, but based off of what? If you believe based off of seeing miracles, here's what happened in John chapter 2. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. So they saw the signs and therefore believed. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. There was a quality to the faith that relied on miracles that Jesus knew wasn't genuine and wouldn't last. The miracles are good for sparking something, 
catching our attention, drawing us in. But if we have a faith in Jesus that relies upon seeing miracles, that is a weak faith. It can't sustain us. Here's what one person says about this kind of faith. It says, miracle faith is like the caffeine in an espresso. It wakes you up, but then it quickly fades, leaving you tired and still in need of rest. It's also addicting. That's why those who followed him in chapter two, like we just read, were leaving him in chapter six. Miracles aren't bad things, but they aren't the best things. The people of Israel all throughout the Old Testament saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And they still worshiped idols. Because the faith that rests on seeing miracles, God, if you do these crazy things, then I'll believe. What ultimately happens is we get addicted to that kind of faith. And then when we're not seeing the miracles, we think, this God's not even real. I'm going to do miracles. It's a call to believe, but based off of what? It's not based off of miracles. It's not based off of signs or omens or hidden messages where we demand God to jump through our hoops, constantly proving himself to us. It's not a faith that rests on emotions or says, man, it, it, unless I feel this way, I just, I just don't know that I can trust that God's real. But man, when he comes, oh, I feel it. I feel like his, I, I just feel him. I feel, feel it. I feel the peace. But if I'm not feeling that, I just, God, I don't know if you're real. Maybe here's a good question for us to help us discern what our faith is relying on. Maybe ask yourself this, if God did blank, my faith in him would be so much stronger. If God did what? If God brought healing here, if God gave me that job, if God fixed this, my man, I can't even tell you, my faith would be so much stronger. I would follow him so much more diligently. Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. What he means is this. The faith in Jesus that relies not on sight or miracles or feelings, but on the word of God is better. Blessed is that man and woman who doesn't see me and yet believes. Because look, here's God's desire and his design, that we believe who he is based off of who he says he is. That's it. A, there is a reason why God has not only written this through the hands of human authors, but preserved it across centuries, thousands of years later. We can confidently hold this and know that it's the word of God. God's done that. Because he's designed it. He desires that you believe who he is based off of what he says. Not based off how you feel. Not based off of your circumstances. Not based off of whether he works a miracle in your life. Just a couple days ago, I was driving in the car with our, our family and we were low on gas. The light, the gas light went on. And you know how in the cars you can newer cars, you can turn on and see like exactly how many miles you have to stretch that thing all the way, right? For somewhere, I don't know where he picked this up, but my oldest son has gotten really nervous of running out of gas. So the moment that, like he's constantly asking, how much gas do we have left out? How much gas do we have? So when he hears that light go on, I'm like, oh, we got to get gas. He's like, we're going to run out of gas <laughs> on the freeway. We're going to run out of gas. And every exit we're passing, he's like, dad, dad, are we going to run out of gas? Dad, dad, we need to get gas. Get off here, dad, dad. And I'm telling him, buddy, I need you to trust me. I, we're not going to run out of gas. I know what I'm doing. I know how many miles we have to go. You don't need to worry. Trust when I tell you we will not run out of gas, all right? Okay, dad, okay. Dad, dad, there's another exit. Get off. We need to get gas. We're going to run out of gas. Dad, are we going to make it? We're going to make it? And I'm trying to teach him, you can trust my word. But he doesn't want to, Right? And it's so similar to us with the Lord. He tells us so clearly who he is. 
He tells us about his character, about his nature. He tells us all the ways in which he's acted in the past, who he is, who he will always be saying, trust me, believe who I am. And yet we're constantly like, "Um, God, gas is really low right now. You better get off. It's like, trust me. Trust who I am. Even when all the information you're receiving from your five senses tells you something different, you can trust what I've said. You can trust my word. That kind of faith is better than seeing miracles. It is a gracious and beautiful thing from God to help us believe that way, relying on his word, because his word is true and it is reliable no matter your experience, no matter your feelings, your emotions, your life circumstances, your background, the word of God is living and active. It is trustworthy and reliable. He says, this is the means through which I want you to know me. And so Thomas, though it's amazing what you've just experienced, there are countless others who will come after you who will never have a chance to see me with their eyes, but their faith will be so solid because it is built on the foundation of the word of who I've said I am. Blessed are those. They have something better than you do right now, Thomas. Do you believe that? Or do you believe it would have been better if I could see Jesus with my eyes? Jesus says, what you have today, church, is better. We have a saying in our culture, right? Seeing is believing. I'm not going to believe that unless I see it. But if I see it, I'll believe it. Seeing is believing. But actually, according to the Bible, believing is real seeing. Believing is actual sight. Because the Bible always describes true sight as faith. Which is precisely actually not seeing with your eyes. The Bible says that's what true sight is. True blindness is unbelief. True sight is faith. Faith sees what is most real, is what the Bible teaches us. What we see with the eyes of faith is more real than what we see with physical eyes. The Hebrews 11 says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. That's true sight. Where God reveals things through his word. And in fact, without the word, we cannot see Jesus. But when we see with faith, this kind of seeing empowers us to do what the Bible says, to walk by faith and not by sight. That's what author John Bloom says. He says, glorious, inexpressible joy comes not from seeing Jesus now, but by believing in him now. Those who believe in Jesus in this age are more blessed than those who have seen him because believing is true seeing. And it is faith sight, not eyesight, that results in eternal life. Faith sight and not eyesight that results in eternal life. In fact, all of the Christian life, we are engaged in faith sight and not eyesight. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us, let us fix our eyes not on things that are seen. The things that are seen are temporary but let us fix our eyes on the things that are unseen. They're eternal. In fact, this whole book, John tells us after this story, the whole purpose you have this book is that you might believe and have faith sight to see who Jesus is. Look what he says. Jesus did many other signs which are not written in this book. But the ones I've chosen to write about, the ones that are written here, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John is saying everything you need to believe is here. Everything you need to enjoy, trust, and follow Jesus is in his word. Everything you need to believe in Jesus is right here in his word. Every miracle you need to witness is here. Every emotion you need to be stirred to feel is here. Every word you need to hear is here. God's not holding out on you. 
saying this is most of what you need, but I got a couple extra things. If you seek me more, like diligently enough, I'll give them to you. All that you need to believe and follow and trust and enjoy the Lord is right here in his word. He's given us everything that we need. His word will give us sight to see and confess, my Lord and my God. Jesus does not leave us alone in our doubts and in our fears and in our lack of sight. Like he came to Thomas, he comes to you and he comes to me and he invites us to believe. He comes to us with his sure and steady word. He comes to us saying, I have done everything you need to prove to you who I am, to prove what I've done, to prove how I feel about you, to prove the identity about who you are because of what I've done. And so if you're struggling, come to me. Come to me with your unbelief. It's a beautiful story in Mark chapter 9 of a father who has a son. The son has been possessed by a demon since his childhood for years. It's so bad that when this demon comes over this child, this child throws himself into the fire, throws himself into the water to drown. You can imagine the anguish that a father might be feeling about raising this son, never knowing at any moment he could throw himself to his own death. The fear, the panic, the the anxiety, the worry. Jesus comes to his town one day and a bunch of crowds are gathered around this father with his son and Jesus comes to inquire what's going on. And this father says to Jesus, Here's what's going on with my son. He's possessed by a demon. I've tried everything. I don't know what to do. Constantly nervous and afraid. And he says, if you can do anything, Jesus, please, would you heal him? And Jesus' response, he goes, if I can, (laughs) if I can, if I can do anything, you're saying, the, the creator of the universe the one who upholds everything. I hold everything together. I created everything with my word. If I can heal your son. Now he doesn't say it. I don't think so sarcastically. He says, if I can. He says, I can can do anything for those who believe. And his father is very honest. He says to Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. With his greatest fear and his greatest worry, the thing most important to him, he comes to Jesus in total honesty and essentially says, Jesus, I believe, but I don't believe. Would you help me? And Jesus heals his son. Jesus doesn't turn away and say, I'll come back when your faith is better. Jesus meets this man right where he's at, where he says, I believe, but he says, I don't know, I don't know. I I don't believe too. Help me. And Jesus heals his son. And I think he extends the exact same invitation to every single one of us this morning, wherever we may be at, to be honest, to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I believe. But man, everything I'm receiving and thinking and feeling, it just makes me, if I'm honest, feel like I don't believe. Help me. Help me. And Jesus is a kind and compassionate Savior who welcomes us just as we are. So would we come to him this morning? Let's pray.